Snap Studios. When I was a kid, visiting my cousins in Detroit, every evening, six o'clock, we'd run top speed to the TV to watch Detroit's own new dance show featuring us. The neighbors up the street, the older cousins, people we know dancing. And one good turn on the dance floor can make you Detroit famous. I love every single thing about it with a fierceness, this music, the slang, the fashion. And one dude always kills it. He actually wears a black cape on the dance floor. Outrageous. So, I start sporting a cape too. Everywhere I go, like a talisman, a piece of joy, maybe hoping it'll protect me from this city I love. A sea of trauma as Detroit staggers from violence. I grow up, move away to California, to Oakland, and I arrive in the middle of a different explosion of music, art, style, and don't believe the hype. This new renaissance does not begin in San Francisco. Now, it's here. San Francisco's poor next door cousin across the bridge, Oakland, where the beats are bumping, the dancing is fire, the clothes are wild. And I've seen this before. Because just like Detroit, Oakland is burning. Even as new tech billionaires transform the Bay Area into a playground for the digital elite, like previous settlers, our new overlords, they don't appreciate that there's people already here. And suddenly whole communities are squeezed out, priced out, and the kids, kids fight back the only way they know how, through art. And just like we had a name for ours, they've got a name for theirs. Hyphy. And yes, there is a story. Today, we finally get to tell it. In partnership with our new home station, KQED, Snap proudly presents Hyphy Kids Got Trauma. My name is from Washington. Truly, I wish every kid could wear a cape when you're listening. The snap judgment. Today, we have a special episode from our friends at KQD's Right Now Is podcast. It's from host Pendarvis Harshaw's series, Hyphy Kids Got Drama. In 2006, Penn was 18, going on 19, and he had a front row seat to one of the most notable times in Bay Area hip hop history period often referred to as the hyphy movement it was an era of up-tempo bass heavy music airbrushed white t-shirts candy painted cars stunner shades and while there was a lot of partying a lot of celebration there was also a lot of pain that same year Oakland saw its second highest annual homicide total ever Penn experienced all the highs and lows back then but he felt like the full story of the culture didn't get told until now, sensitive listeners are advised. The date on my LG flip phone reads January 26, 2006. I'm staring at the digital screen posted in the lobby of this fancy ass hotel in downtown San Jose. Business casual attire means that I'm sporting the same button up collared shirt, baggy khakis and Steve Madden shoes that I wear to funerals and club functions. But today I'm at a journalism gala. I'm a baby reporter, 18 years old. The beard hasn't connected and the hairline hasn't receded. Folks are all dressed fancy and eating tiny sandwiches. This is journalism. I'm with my folks from New America Media's Youth Outlook Publication, a nonprofit that helps young writers get their foot into the journalism world. I'm in the right place to be, but still kind of nervous. So in the middle of all the lobby chatter, I'm tucked off hiding behind my illuminated screen of my phone. No games on that joint, no social media or internet browser either. I'm just messing with ringtones and reading old text messages. And then a new message from my partner Malcolm. They killed Will. 
After a quick call for further clarification, I hang up and I throw my phone. Quarterback Hail Mary style, smooth across the room. The phone was okay. I broke. I leave the event in a drunken blur and I get a ride back to Oakland with some coworkers. Yeah, drunk at 18. But what does that mean? I mean, I'd been smoking and drinking since middle school, around the same time that I met with E. Clay. We were classmates, and outside of school, we kicked it at the Manzanita Center, a youth center on East 28th Street in East Oakland in a neighborhood we call the Dubs, or Murder Dubs. Will was a part of a circle of folks who hung out there, played basketball, rode scooters. Y'all remember those razor joints? He loved those, and the motorized ones too. We used to smoke, shoot dice, rap, crack jokes. He was a funny dude who loved the neighborhood. And the last we talked, he had a baby on the way. Life changed that day for me and a lot of folks in my circle. And that was just one day in the midst of a year that would bring me and my friends some of the highest highs and lowest lows, leaving magnificent memories and deep-seated scars. A few years ago, I was bending corners around town when I saw a couple of words written in aerosol spray on a wall underneath an overpass. Hyphy kids got trauma. Bingo. Say less. That's the untold story. Our story. My story. There was a lot of pain and grief intertwined in that era. It was the catalyst for the exuberant lifestyle. It made us party more aggressive gig harder, roll fatter blunts, buy bigger bottles, stunt with all four car doors open with the RIP memorial pamphlet on the dashboard of the Buick. Ecstasy pills were popped like vitamins, and goofy glasses, they masked the weight of the reality we were facing. And somehow, that's all the outside world saw. On March 7th, 2006, legendary Oakland rapper Too Short teamed up with super producer Lil Jon to drop the hit song, Blow the Whistle. I go on and on. Stupid slap, a bass line that could awaken gargoyles with energetic drums and a catchy hook. It was a union of Atlanta's popular crunk sound with the Bay Area's hyphy wave. The very next week, on March 14th, 2006, Legendary Vallejo rapper E-40 dropped his album, My Ghetto Report Card. The lead single, Tell Me When To Go, was also produced by Lil Jon and featured fan favorite East Oakland rapper Keek The Sneak. The drums sounded like two kangaroos kicking a trunk of your car. The hook, simple, catchy, and cool. The beat was another up-tempo marriage of crunk and hyphy, and it also made for a classic track. Those releases were just the tip of the iceberg in a year that brought about some of the most notable hip-hop and R&B songs from our region. On a given day, I'd ride shotgun in my friend Scraper, blasting San Francisco rappers Messi Marvis San Quinn. we pull up next to a classic Chevy van, custom designed with flat screens in the headrest, sound system knocking East Bay rappers The Jacka or Bathgate, EA Ski or Mr. Fab. We'd pull up to an event and the DJ would be spinning one of the mega hits by the pack or Keisha Cole. I'd dip out early, hop the Bart turnstile, and put my headphones on, listening to Zion I or Guapale. There was a bunch of music to pull from, but for me, the track that kicked things off in 2006 was a song called Turf Sup by an artist named Bita Weeda. Bita Weeda is a neighborhood star a fly dresser, but not overly flashy. A dark-skinned brother with deep waves who knows a little bit of everybody. He's a rapper and a producer, as well as an owner of a clothing brand and a line of cannabis. Back in 2006, he had just released his first studio mixtape called Homework and a subsequent album, Turfology 101. The album's lead single, Turf's Up, got radio play, and the video had a slew of cameos. The remix featured an all-star lineup from that era, 
including Too Short and E-40. The song is an up-tempo, braggadocious track. Something to dance to, ride to, throw your neighborhood up to. For Bita, he was simply putting his real life on wax. We was youngsters, we couldn't get into the club like that. So, like, we would just get in the car, get alcohol, just ride through the East all day, you know what I'm saying? And just, the East was our playground. We turned into, like, club on wheels, you know what I'm saying? So that's basically what the song was just about. The album also featured a few songs that spoke to the trends of the time, like Ripper Slippers. You remember the Ripper Slippers? That was the shoes that all the little females would get from the, uh, the beauty supply the Chinese slippers, you know what I'm saying? So it was just like everything that literally was going on in the culture, I was just letting people know how we was getting down out here, you know what I mean? Bita was painting pictures of how folks were living, from partying to pimping and even the more militant mindset. On his homework mixtape, Bita Wita dropped this one song that spoke directly to that radical ideology that so many young folks have here in the Bay. The track was simply called, We Ain't Listen. I was just expressing, you know, what we were going through and just giving the world a light on what we got going on. Because I always felt like Oakland was different. We was different. You know what I'm saying? I knew it was something different about us. You feel me? And I kind of just wanted to share that with the world. You know what I'm saying? He's right. Oakland was different. It was an epicenter of culture, caught in an upwind of creativity. And in 2006, at the same time, there were plenty of reasons for young folks in the town to ignore every single word from authority figures. Oakland had long been under-resourced and over-policed. Families were facing predatory housing loans and rising rents. After decades of constant growth, the 2000 census marked the last time the black population in Oakland increased. I had homies move to Antioch, Las Vegas, and Texas. I started seeing more white folks jogging through the hood. It was the onset of gentrification. Mayor Jerry Brown was focused on redeveloping downtown, adding thousands of new residents and cracking down on sideshows, the illegal car shows native to the Bay Area. I watched as downtown changed and new people came. Things shifted, but the sideshows remained. The police department, then entering the third year of a mandatory federal oversight, had its own issues. I saw conflicts of all types, people in my family struggling financially and people close to me going to fight in the war on terror overseas. And personally, for me, the biggest conflict was the community violence. That left the deepest wounds. Just weeks after my friend Will was killed, Bita Wita released his first project, and his music helped me get through that hard time. Hard for me, and arguably harder for Bita, as he not only knew Will, he was one of the last people to see him alive. Snap returns. Pandarvis tries to find his way through the minefield. Stay tuned. In my house, we don't agree on anything food-wise, except this, Dave's Killer Bread. Why? Because it's awesome. Just look at a loaf. Take a slice. It's made of real stuff. Delicious stuff. Tasty stuff. Look, see. No wonder it's America's number one organic bread. Visit Dave'sKillerBread.com to learn more and look for Dave's Killer Bread in the bread aisle of your local grocery store. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread amplified. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance, too, with the name your price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the hyphy kids got trauma episode. And just before the break, Pandaris Harshaw told us about the loss of a friend and how it colored everything he saw around him. Sensitive listeners are advised. I saw conflicts of all types. 
people in my family struggling financially and people close to me going to fight in the war on terror overseas. And personally, for me, the biggest conflict was the community violence. That left the deepest wounds. Just weeks after my friend Will was killed, Beta Weeda released his first project, and his music helped me get through that hard time. Hard for me, and arguably harder for Beta, as he not only knew Will, he was one of the last people to see him alive. Man, you know, I always say, bro, it was crazy, bro. I, I was supposed to be dead, bro. That day, Beta Weeda and a crew of folks are coming back from a performance at a party in Chico, a small town about three and a half hours north of Oakland. Rich in agriculture and full of nature, it's a college town that sits at the northern end of the Sacramento Valley. A drastic difference from Oakland. So we slide out there. We had hella fun, did hella promoting. And I'll never forget how it was, like, because it was hell of us from the hood that went out there. And, like, just how much fun we had, bro. We didn't have to look over our shoulders. You know what I'm saying? But Bita says that after they left and made their way back to Oakland, that energy shifted. Bro, it was just like a it was dark ass cloud. It just got dark. And then I never forget, like my um my big bro, he was in the front. He's like, all right, we back in the you know, y'all keep y'all put your head on the swivel. You know what I'm saying? Y'all know what time it is, you feel me? The crew pulled back into Oakland and Bita kicked up at a spot in the dubs. He gave a friend a haircut, and then he realized it was getting late and he didn't have his car. So he called another friend to give him a ride across town to his lady's crib. So my homie come pick me up. Boom, he come pick me up, take me to the west. I'm hella tired, instantly pass out, right? My phone die. You feel me? So my phone go off, you know what I'm saying? I wake up in the morning, I turn my phone on. As soon as I turn my phone on, my ringing, you feel me? I answer it, you feel me? Like, where you at, woo woo woo? I'm like, bro, I'm good. And I just remember it was like, man, Everybody dead. I'm like, huh? Everybody dead. A short period after Beta left the neighborhood, someone came to the main intersection and started spraying bullets. Five people were hit in total. Will and another brother by the name of Jay Black died. Before the shooting happened, and before Beta left the hood, he saw Will on the block. And I never forget the look on Willie's face when I drove. Like, I just looked at him. You feel me? You know what I'm saying? He was standing on the corner. I don't know. I just looked at him. You know what I'm saying? We looked at his up. I don't know. It was weird, bro. But I never forget that. And, you know, I just be tripping off that. You feel me? Like, I could have been, if I would have been up there a little bit longer, ain't no telling. You know what I'm saying? As all of this was happening, Beta's music was blowing up. Behind the scenes, he was working with Tajay of the legendary Souls of Mischief hip hop group. They're a branch of the Almighty Hieroglyphics group. The folks who brought you the song 93 Till Infinity and one of the most well-known logos in hip-hop. Tajay is a slim brown-skinned brother from East Oakland who can get loud when it's time. And most times, he has a calm aura that makes sense once you learn that he's trained in martial arts and is a full-time architectural designer. Back in 2006, he had been in the rap game for over a decade and was looking to put other artists on. Beat Weeda's music, specifically the song We Ain't Listening, caught Tajay's ear. It just sounded scary, like, man, oh, wow, this is, this sounds like, um, like, if you listen to this song, it sounds very tribal, like, hey, hey. it's just like, um, when you think about rap music and you think about the, the stereotypes about it, it's, it's, it's scary Negro music from the inner city. That song exemplified that. Tajay says that the fear factor was a driving force that made the song powerful. Like, obviously it was music, but it was scary and that's I think what I liked about it you know what I'm saying I felt like a suburban kid almost like what is this Ooh, this is what those negroes are talking about in the in the inner city you know what I mean though you say scary but you say it with a smile on your face oh yeah I mean cause I'm I'm black and I'm from the inner city like so I know it's just young letting off steam musically you feel what I'm saying though but that's really what hip hop is in general rapping like we just rapping you know what I'm saying so to me it exemplified the same the same feeling that maybe you know uh, Raising Hell or uh, Rock Box or something that, dun, 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 you know or, or uh, it's like a jungle sometimes like it exemplified that spirit of there's a whole other world out here that you are not being exposed to and we're going to make it sound beautiful over music A few weeks after the release of Beta's first project there was another shooting in the dubs 
Bullet Holes rattled Beta's custom-designed van. No one was injured, but the shooting left holes in the image of Beta's album cover that wrapped the vehicle. The incident pushed Beta, Tajay, and Beta's manager, J-Mo, to put a plan into play. Tajay and the Hieroglyphics crew own a building in East Oakland, a few miles from the dubs. Tajay invited Beta to start using that space as his home base. And once Beta had a foot in the door, he started bringing in other artists from the community. Once Tajay started seeing the talent, he could have been on some like, nah, Beta, you doing too much. You feel me? Like, just you. He opened up the hall downstairs for us and was like, y'all can have this down here. You know what I'm saying? And like, that whole situation, like, basically sparked a lot of careers. Tajay saw the Hyro building as more than just a recording studio for the East Bay's emerging talent. It was almost like an anti-violence initiative. I mean, literally, this place was so active that crime went down in the dubs. You feel what I'm saying, though? Because all the criminals was here recording records. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, for real, though. You know what I'm saying? No, I mean, you know, all, all, all the factors was in here uh, <laughs> making music. You know what I'm saying, though? The roster of folks who came through those doors and made music and or contributed to the culture included Filthy Rich and DJ Fresh, Moses Music, Big Hungry, and Jay Stalin, Shady Nate, Tower, and the late Zoe the Roaster. It's where, a few years later, D'Lo would record and film the video for his anthem, NoHo. It's where I would eventually work with Jamon Drew and Young Gully to record the Grant Station project, dedicated to Oscar Grant. It was these artists who contributed to Bay Area hip-hop for the next decade plus, making hyphy songs as well as mob music, underground hits, selling thousands of records, and rocking shows across the country. These were dudes from the neighborhood, making music to express pain, celebrate life, and document culture. But nationally, that wasn't the narrative. The way the Bay Area culture was being depicted wasn't exactly what was happening on the streets. Yes, there was some goofy dances and some funny fashion, but man, it was so much deeper than just going dumb on top of cars. If you ask Tajay, that rebellious, hyperactive energy is really in our DNA. Me mugging and all that kind of stuff, and you know what I'm saying, shaking your dreads and all that. To me, it was a very African vibe. You know what I'm saying, though? Dancing hard, you know what I'm saying, though? Very, very within the lineage of the diaspora. Like, I can you know see what I'm that. saying, though? I can see that. So, kind of like how breakdancing is, or popping, or all that kind of stuff, yeah. right? So to me, it was more tribal, like, and this how our, these are our tribal dances that we do out here in the Bay where we are the Hyphy tribe. And the people of that Hyphy tribe, we were at war, fighting against club security and local police, fighting against East Coast hip hop biases and corporate run radio stations and culture vultures, fighting against other community members, and sometimes even fighting against ourselves. We're talking about a generation of kids who were born into the crack cocaine induced era of the war on drugs and raised by people who saw civil rights leaders slain. There were already issues here, as Tajay reminds us. The trauma pre-existed the hyphy movement, and I think the hyphy movement helped to free up and help people to unpack, or at least evade a little bit of the trauma. We didn't know it at the time, but that unpacking of generational trauma was unfettered joy while dancing off a pill at a gas station, or driving on the wrong side of the road while listening to your favorite song at a high volume. For me, it was smoking and drinking as if every day were the weekend. It was pills and syrup. It was parties. It was riding around with my partners, hanging out the window of the sunroof of this plum-colored Sebring that I got from an auction. Having fun, despite all of the danger and despair. Maybe we were numbing ourselves to get through the trauma. Maybe the hyphy movement kept us alive. Whatever the case, the dichotomy of that era, specifically the year 2006, left the mark that I can never erase. And I'm not the only one. Just ask Bita. You hear about how the murder rate was so high, how that was like one of the worst years of Oakland. But bro, I had so much fun. Like, like it didn't seem like that. You know what I'm saying? And it seemed like I was around all that. You know what I mean? It just seemed like a lot of love. Like, yeah, we had our ups and downs. We was broke. You know what I'm saying? But we didn't care. We all took care of each other. 06 was very special, bro. Maybe it was that contrast that created the fun. How life and death happened all at once. It made it memorable for us. And unfortunately, 
only a portion of that story was told until now. R.I.P. Will, J. Black, and so many more. Big, big thanks to the entire team at KQD's Right Now is Podcast, Hyphy Kids Got Trauma. I love this show, and there is so much more. So much more where it came from is available right now on any podcast device. Hosted by Pandarvis Harshaw, produced by Maya Cueva, edited by Chris Hambrick, sound design and original music by Trackademics, with support from Eric Arnold, Jin Xian, Holly Kernan, Victoria Malion, Marisol Medina Cadena, Gabe Moline, Jorge Olivares, Delincy Parham, Cesar Saldana, Sayer Cavedo, Katie Springer, Nastia Vonaskaya, and Rice Stottenborough. We'll have links to everything Hyphy Kids Got Trauma at snapjudgment.org. And right after the break, another piece of Bay Area history you are not going to want to miss. Stay tuned. Support for Snap Judgment comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is the only software your business will ever need. Featuring a suite of integrated business applications, Odoo connects your business operations together so you can get more done in less time. Odoo has apps for everything. CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, marketing, manufacturing, you name it. Odoo's got it. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash snap. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash snap. Welcome back to Snap Judgment. My name is Ben Washington. Our next story takes us to the early 1950s, San Francisco. And little Gus Lee is just a lost kid trying to figure out how to survive. Every time little Gus Lee found himself in San Francisco's Chinatown, he'd begin a kind of frantic search. I would uh, see a vague, fuzzy picture of a Chinese woman, and for reasons I could not explain to myself, I would chase her. I would run after her. And, I, I mean, I couldn't even articulate that I was looking for my mother. Uh, but that's what I was doing. Back then, I had no memory of her face. It was 1952. Gus hadn't seen his mother for months. I asked, where's mommy? Where, where'd mommy go? And my sisters assured me that our mother had gone back to China to take care of her father, who was ill, and that she would return as soon as she could. But then he came home from school one day, and a new woman showed up at the apartment. She's blonde, lots of curves, like a, a movie actresses. She looked like someone that came out of a magazine. She wasn't wearing the Chinese chi paw that his mother always wore. She had on a pillbox hat and a veil. She smelled like flowers. And she was speaking, you know, the foreign language, uh, English. And I'm not sure what she said, but it was in a nice voice. When Gus's father introduced her, he said to call her Miss Edith. I remember she did something affectionate, like... You know, she touched my arm or she touched my face. Edith and his father married soon after. And as soon as she came home, it seemed like the temperature in the house changed completely. Family heirlooms, good luck symbols, they all began to disappear from the apartment. So did pictures of Gus's mother. Under Edith, there was to be no mention of Gus's mom, no more Chinese spoken at home, and absolutely no Chinese food. We are only going to have American food, and you're going to be an American. So everything was controlled. I had a one- or a two-minute limit. She would time me so I wouldn't speak Chinese in the bathroom. Another one of Edith's rules? Gus was to be out of her sight. Even when school let out, he still wasn't allowed in the apartment. I wasn't to ring the doorbell. I wasn't to knock on the door. I wasn't to uh, yell up at her if I was in trouble. 
Actually, I could not come back until she would open an upper window and whistle, like for a dog. So, every day, Gus would be locked out and on the street. And the street was where he was most vulnerable. Gus was around seven at the time, but he was built like a five-year-old, and he acted like a three-year-old. He could barely speak English. And he happened to be the only Chinese kid in the neighborhood. They called him China Boy. I had 20 over 900 vision, which is legally blind. Uh, I would walk into telephone poles. I couldn't street fight and I couldn't play sports. After school, he would try and hide, stay invisible, stay out of trouble. And uh, then Big Jimmy would show up. Big Jimmy Timms was the neighborhood bully, always on the lookout for more fresh meat. Big Jimmy, he was Godzilla. Big boned, big head. I was terrified of him. One day, Gus was playing in his usual spot. An alleyway on Golden Gate Avenue. And that was my hideout space. And I would uh, play with weeds and watch ants and hope no one bothered me. He didn't see Big Jimmy's fist until it came out of nowhere. Hey, China boy, crap for brains. You got any coin for me? Where are you hiding your coin? Don't have nothing. Don't, no have, no have nothing. Leave, leave, leave me alone. And uh, he hit me a couple more times until I went to the concrete. When I, I, I gathered my senses, I staggered towards the apartment. I rang the doorbell many times, and when there was no answer, I began pounding on the door itself. I was sobbing. The door finally opened, and there was Edith. And she said, What are you doing here? I told you not to come back. Go outside and play. Slam. I wasn't willing to go back on the street, so I stood on the stoop and huddled in the corner, hoping no one could see me for about three hours until she opened the door. Every kid on the street learned how to hit to the face by practicing on Gus. So, eventually, a neighbor saw him get pounded and left in the street. His name was Hector Villanueva. White short sleeve shirt, big biceps, big triceps, bulging shoulders, narrow waist. Uh, looked like Captain America with a sweet Chicano accent. And he says, Hey, Hoven, these, these kids, they, they, they pound you. They, they, they stuff you inside garbage cans. Uh, how come you don't fight back, man? Hey, you, you come with me. And he, he walked me to my apartment. He rings the doorbell. My dad shows up. And he says, Mr. Lee, you know me from the garage. Yes? Your boy, your Hoven here, your Chico, your Nino, he's, he's very quick, you know, but he can't fight. So you, you got to teach him boxeo. You, you got to teach him pugilato. You got to send him down to the YMCA boxing program to teach him how to save his life. You, you're going to look around one day and your boy, he gone. You go down to McAllister and there'll be this smudge. That used to be your son, man. And he says, you go save his life. YMCA. And then he rubbed the top of my head and he smiled and he walked away. But Edith wasn't having it. She didn't want to spend so much money on Gus. That's when his dad said, You should like it. He could be there five days a week, maybe even six. And there's, as I recall, this dead silence. And it was like, really? It was a Saturday when he first went. My father rode out YMCA 220 Golden Gate on a placard on a string. And he put it around my neck and he put me on the bus. When Gus got off the bus, people on the street stopped to help the lost little boy with a placard tied around his neck. They took him to the front door of 220 Golden Gate. I was led to the locker room. The junior leader found, lost and found gym clothes. 
uh, which uh, nothing fit. So I wore my scuffed up street shoes, uh, gigantic clown-like gym trunks, and a tank top. I actually tried putting the straps over my head, you know, so they wouldn't fall off. In the gym, there were dozens of boys practicing boxing. There was an elevated boxing ring. And there was a gigantic man heading towards Gus. And he has hair, I mean, hairy arms and hairy shoulders and hair coming out of the top of his shirt, giant boulder-like head. This was Coach Tony. He walked him over to the punching bags. And he says, just hit it. And I hit it, and I start to cry. The coach looked at me and said, not only is this kid not a boxer, he can't be an athlete, and I'm not sure he's a kid. I finally, you know, stood up and said something like, no want to, no can, no can do. And he said something like, oh, crap, kid, you got some fight, good. Starting that day, Gus basically considered his coaches as his enemies. He didn't really understand why they were so insistent on forcing him to do these painful exercises, or why they were so nice while doing it. One of the ways that Coach Tony won my heart is he took me up to Lola's YMCA cafeteria, and he fed me. Lola plied Gus with the full menu of American diner food. She made him bologna, then tuna fish sandwiches. She served up potato chips and milkshakes. A lot of milkshakes. And then I knew I I would follow him anywhere. They had him lift weights. They fattened him up. And then they told him it was time. He was ready to go into the ring. So I climbed into the ring. I'm shaking. Uh, The bell rings. Coach says, go do it, kid. I get up. I walk towards center ring, and immediately after touching gloves, I sprinted for the ropes. I dove through the ropes. I forgot that it was an elevated ring, so I just smashed myself on the floor. I got up, ran for the stairs, and I ran directly into a wall. I was KO'd. Coach wouldn't let Gus off the hook until he could land that first jab. As Gus got stronger, for the first time, people started to call him something other than China Boy. And after school one day, the most popular girl in class, Phyllis Green, came up to him. She called him Gus. And I remember thinking, who's Gus? That's me. I hadn't heard a kid say Gus. She puts her arm in mine, and she says, now you walk me home. What they didn't see was that Big Jimmy was walking behind them. And with that gigantic, you know, 85-inch fist, he's, uh, he's hit me in the back of the head. And right in front of the prettiest girl in class, Gus suddenly found himself in a familiar position, face down on the asphalt. He proceeds to basically just kick me down the street. Who do you think was worse, Edith or Big Jimmy? Oh, Edith, clearly. Big Big Jimmy was my best friend compared to Edith. So I remember I was inside the bathroom attempting to remember Chinese. And I was counting to 10 in Mandarin. And I was remembering tones. And it was like I was recovering a life with my mother. I mean, the last time I spoke Chinese was with her. Edith slams open the door and screams, no Chinese words, no Chinese words in this house. And I said, when my mommy comes back, we speak Chinese again. And then she phoned Eleanor, my oldest sister, and she said, I want you to tell your brother where your mother is. Edith handed Gus the phone. He thought Eleanor would say his mom was in Shanghai, or maybe Suzhou. Instead, Eleanor said, Gus, uh, Chen Sun, our mother is in a cemetery 
in San Bruno. And then I knew. Eleanor would not lie to me. And uh, so I, I set my face. I think I swallowed very hard. And I know that Edith had been waiting for just the precise moment to crush me with the news that my mother was dead. I was back to my old self. I was depressed. I had been defeated. The next time Gus showed up at the Y, he was still limping from his fight with Big Jimmy. His coaches asked him, what's wrong? They forced it out of me. Kid, what's going on? I know I'm crying. I thought my mommy was coming back. And now I know mommy is dead. She was dead when I was five. He told them everything about Edith locking him out of the house. And he told them about Big Jimmy Tims. And he, he picks on small kids. He pounds them. He's the one who took my shoes. And these three men are looking at me, and they look at each other. And they look concerned, which lifts my heart. Tony says, let's train him to beat the crap out of this bully. Coach says, we're taking a ride, get in. And he immediately drives me right back, because that's when Big Jimmy did his work. He was shooting buckets on the uh, the Anza schoolyard. From the car, Coach Tony looked at Big Jimmy's footwork. He checked out his hand-eye coordination. He says, uh, he's a boxer's dream, kid. He's awkward. He actually, he's not an athlete. He doesn't move like an athlete. He doesn't know balance. He's just a big, overweight thumper. He says, but, you know, kid, you're right. The, the guy's huge. Coach Lewis was the ring scientist, and he's the one who asked me, how much time do you need to prepare? And I said, three years. And there was a lot of laughter. And he said, he said, how about two weeks? Because then you know when it's going to happen. Gus had a fight plan. He had a boxing coach. And Coach Lewis knew all he needed now was a little fire in the belly. So he used the idea of his mom, his real mom. And he, he points at me and he says, I don't think that this punk likes your mother. And his giant finger pointing at me. And he says, I want you to remember that. Because Gus was small and Big Jimmy was huge, Gus had to learn how to punch up. Coach Tony uh, faced me and he said, okay, you got three minutes. I circled the bag. I went left. I went right. I made a complete 360. I kept my arms moving, punching the bag, whapping it up, up, up. By the end of the week, I could punch upward. Coach Lewis said, do they serve Navy beans in your cafeteria? Beans messed with the gut, and boxers need to stay away from them before a fight. And I nodded, and he said, what day? I said, Thursday. Your fight's going to be on Thursday, kid. Gus was at the garage one day when Hector asked him if he knew how he was going to start the fight. And then he pulled out a jar full of tractor oil and carefully handed it to Gus. He told him that this jar would totally do the trick. And you pour on his shoes, on his zapatos, all over. This will distract him. He's going to be looking at his shoes. He's going to be really upset, you know? And finally, the day of the fight arrived. The cafeteria served its pork and beans for lunch. Big Jimmy had a big helping. And then, before Gus knew it, it was the end of the school day. I heard the bell. And the bell was just like, it's like the boxing ring bell. Ding! And I positioned myself with the sun at my back. 
and this mass starts coming out. It's the kids. I see this bobbing shape above the mass, and I know I know it's him. So I, I, I picked up the jar, and I loosened it. He's looking at me the way I think you look at a lamb chop. His shoes, his PF flyers, man, they're right in front of me. And I took real good aim, and I got most of the gunk directly on his uh, left foot. And I said, hey, 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 Big Jimmy, your shoes, they ugly. He roared. I went into my stance, and he's swearing at me, which is good. This is all part of the fight plan. He had one punch. I mean, you could see it coming, and you could you could deflect it, which I did. And I punched up, and I hit his throat. And I hit it pretty good. I, I was delivering blows as hard as I could to his midsection. And I know he hit me very, very hard on the left arm because the left arm went numb. He was grasping and swinging and trying to clear his throat. The fight was basically over. And I was gassed. And it's like my ears popped. I was aware of kids yelling and there was a lot of noise. That's when one of the other kids came up behind Big Jimmy and pushed him back into the fight driving Big Jimmy directly into Gus. The next thing Gus knew, he was tackled and knocked to the ground, where he wasn't supposed to be. And he got up and he clunked my head with one of those big rights. My head hit the concrete, and he started kicking me with those big, grutch-covered PF flyers. He kicked me all over that schoolyard. I felt like my head had been broken apart, and every part of me hurt. Before I was out of gas, and now I was, I was out of heart. And I saw this giant finger pointing at me. And it wasn't Big Jimmy's, it was Coach Lewis's. And he said, I don't think this punk likes your mother. I think I got up like a broken crab, but I got up. And I went back to Big Jimmy. I went in and I started boxing him. I circled him. I stuck and moved much slower than before. But he was slowed. And he had been hurt. And he wasn't used to being hurt. Not by a kid. And I just kept punching him. And I knew I had to hit him with a haymaker uppercut. And then I saw his chin. Everything I had, I put into the uppercut. And it connected. It was a little off, but it connected. I had won the fight. I knelt by Big Jimmy and I touched his fists with mine, which said, good fight. Gus was hurt. Tasting the blood in his mouth, he slowly walked towards home. I, I I went up to the apartment door, walked up the steps. I rang the doorbell. Edith opened it and said, What are you doing? I haven't called for you. Go away. I said, I beat Big Jimmy. I don't care what you're saying. Get away from here or I'll... And she raised her hand to strike me, and I instinctively went into stance, hands up, thumb at my eyebrow. She recoiled, and she said, you would raise your hands to me? Seized by the moment, I shouted at her, you not my mommy, and I ain't for your picking on no more. Thanks so much to Gus Lee. Gus Lee is a courage-based leadership trainer and consultant. He's now completing his eighth book, 
courage is a verb. To find out more, go to our website, snapjudgment.org. The original score for that story was by Renzo Gorio. It was produced by Liz Mack. Now you see what just happened there? I'm telling you, it's all about the story. You can get the Snap Judgment Storytelling Podcast for free everywhere. Subscribe before it is too late. Snap is brought to you by the team that knows when the bass drops at the spot, it's time to dance. Except for that Mark Ristic, that's embarrassing. There's Nancy Lopez, Pat C. Miller, Anna Sussman, Renzo Gorio, John Fasile, Shayna Sheely, Taylor Ducat, Flo Wiley, Bo Walsh, Marissa Dodge, David Xmay, and Regina Beriaco. Understand, this is not the news. No way it's news. In fact, you can outfit your minivan with the Alpine audio slapping that deep bass and pull up to pick up the kids, and you would still, even then, not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is PR.